Hello everyone, it's your Peacekeeper coming at you with the next video in our How to Play series on the French Cruiser Line. This is the Tier 9 Saint Louis class of cruisers. The Saint Louis class is, well, it's a paper ship, and as we talked about in the previous video for Charles Martel, uh, they actually come from the same design uh, decision-making process, and it... it in a lot of ways, it's basically the same ship and it would have been in real life. And actually, I would say that the ship's overall design, uh, you know, would be the latter part of World War II. The French redesigned that design to come up with a heavier cruiser with, a, you know, a little bit better anti-aircraft protection and a little bit better, um, you know, overall protection, armor protection. Well... We can stop drawing the comparisons there because, quite honestly, this ship plays nothing like Charles Martel does. And in terms of its in-game play style, I mean, well, let's let's go back and let's start with what is the same. Like all the other French cruisers, this ship excels at that long-range, fire-spamming, close-range AP, de like devastating AP. Uh, that we've come to expect since about tier five. And that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I quite like that. Where the ship primarily differs is in the tiers that it sees consistently. While tier 8 is really kind of a... Eh, kind of messed up matchmaker, meaning you see a lot of tier 10s, this ship almost exclusively sees, sees tier 10s. It's very rare to be in a 7 through 9 match in it. And... With that comes the added problem of the extra lethality and the relative lack of armor and the way the armor is laid out on this ship means that you take damage from every angle. So the armor belt is just 100 millimeters, which is no change from Charles Martel. In fact, if these ships look frighteningly similar, that's because they are. The other thing that is really frustrating about the ship's armor profile is the fact that it is covered only in 25 millimeters of armor in most locations, which means that battleship shells 16 inches or higher will punch clean through that armor. Now, <laughs> it, 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 it shouldn't be a shock to some for me to say this, What's tolerable in Charles Martel, given how close and similar they are, apparently no longer works in Saint Louis. And I struggled, to be honest with you, to play this ship and get a halfway decent game in it. And I suspect a large part of the reason for that is, at starting at Tier 9, the, the predominance of Tier 10 matches and the lack of good Tier 10 maps that have a lot of hard cover or places to uh, block line of sight means that the ship is going to take damage a lot. Whereas Charles Martel, you know, you, you will occasionally run into the 678 match or a 789 match where you have access to maps that are much better laid out and have much more cover. So St. Louis doesn't really change a whole lot in that regard, but it feels like the ship is just a way worse ship. And, and part of that, I think, has to do with the differences in the ship's concealment, with the ship's size, with the ship's rudder shift, with the ship's turning radius, but this ship is just oops, this ship is just a significant downgrade in a lot of ways. In fact, the ship actually feels an awful lot like going from Mogami to Ibuki in that nothing really changes with protection scheme, which is mediocre at best. But the ship doesn't really gain anything either in offensive capabilities. Uh, you know, the, the Mogami Ibuki transition is from usually from 6-inch guns to 8-inch guns because, let's face it, 8-inch Mogami is, is not as viable as it was. Um, and, and the 155s are just a fantastic option on that ship. This ship feels exactly the same. I mean, it, it's very soft. It tends to eat citadels from any angle. And... Uh, Overall, it's really not that fun of a ship to play. One thing that did improve on this ship is the anti-aircraft suite. So, Charles Martel had a okay anti-aircraft suite. 
this ship, you know, ratchets it up to 11, owing to what would have most likely been a, you know, build in the United States or a partial build out in the United States. The, the, the amount of 40 millimeter Bofors and dual purpose gun mounts on board, plus the addition of defensive fire, makes for a very, very potent anti-aircraft suite. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the actual stats. So let's do exactly that. 40,900 hit points, which is, uh, you know, 2,900 hit points more than, than uh, the Charles Martel. Armor up to 140 millimeters, and it sure as heck doesn't feel like it. Torpedo damage reduction of 19%. Your main battery consists of three triple 8-inch guns. They are mounted in two turrets forward, one turret aft. You, they have a 18.3 kilometer main battery firing range and 8.8 .8 second reload time. That's going to be with the reload module, and we'll talk about that in a little, little bit. Uh, 180 degree turn time, 26 and a half seconds. Dispersion of 148, but... Uh, that HE shell damage, 2,800 damage, plus 19% chance of fire. Yeah, that's pretty nice. And <laughs> what is also very nice is the AP shells on this thing. In fact, I found the AP shells to be almost a more reliable source of damage than trying to get HE to get fires on battleships. And that, that sounds really odd given how potent that 19% fire chance is, but... Um, you'll, you'll see a little bit of it in the, the battle video. Uh, shell, shell speed itself, high explosive has a different shell speed, so easier to hit with high explosive than AP. Secondary battery consists of seven dual 100 millimeter guns. Uh, those are going to have a 6.3 kilometer firing range that's going to be with advanced firing training on the captain. And they do 1400 damage when they are HE, 8% uh, 8 fire chance. Torpedo tubes, it's going to be the same torpedoes that we've had since tier 4 or 5. They are the 9 kilometer 60 knot uh, 550 millimeter torpedoes. 14,833 damage, 1.3 kilometer detection range. Um, they are basically an area denial weapon or a panic torp weapon. Uh, you do have very good fire arcs on them, so I mean that's at least nice, but uh... <laughs> They're, they're, they're very limited in their use because the ship spends most of its time at longer ranges. Any aircraft defense is one of the stronger suits of this. So starting out at 6 kilometers, those 100 millimeter dual purpose gun mounts, uh, 7 of those, 7 dual mounts of those. She also has 4 quad 40 millimeter Bofors, 8 dual 40 millimeter Bofors, 8 dual 20 millimeter, and these are going to be Orlikans like in the US, and then 12 singles, and that steps down to 2.4. So 6042, 2.4, and that's going to be without a uh, without all the anti-aircraft stuff. So if you built this out to an anti-aircraft build, it goes out further than that. Max speed, 34.6 knots. That's going to be with the speed flag. I think it's 33 and a half without. 33 flat without. And 720 meter turning radius, 8.1 second rudder shift time. That 720 meter turning radius, it, you wouldn't think that only 30 meters of turning radius would make a huge difference, but let me be the first one to tell you that 0.2 seconds and 30, millimeter, uh, 30 meters of turning radius makes a big difference, especially when the ship just doesn't want to heave over like I would think it would want to. Detection range by sea is of ele is 11 and a half kilometers by air is 7.1 kilometers. So by the time you get detected by aircraft in a full any aircraft build, you could mount your um, you know all of your AA gun mods and, and then basically as soon as you get detected, surprise, here's any aircraft fire for your you you carrier. In terms of upgrades, I'm running auxiliary armaments mod one in the first slot for the increase in the. Uh, any aircraft mount survivability that's going to double its hit point pool. It also doubles the hit point pool of your secondary batteries, but uh, this ship's not... I mean, it has a lot of secondaries, but I, this would be like the last ship that I would want to build for close quarters engagements simply because of the fact that your ship's not very maneuverable, which means dodging torpedoes at close range is a bit hairy at times. Plus, at Tier 9, there's not too many maps where close range brawling is going to help you. 
you don't have enough armor to actually mitigate damage from uh, incoming sources, so <laughs> it, it's really not a, a, a good idea to go brawling in this ship. Uh, main armaments mod one, you know, this ship does seem to lose its its main armament fairly regularly from incoming fire, but I guess that's kind of expected. It's a, it's a cruiser. It's a heavy cruiser. It's a lightly armored heavy cruiser at that. And so uh, you could run main armaments mod one for the 20% reduction in your chance of main battery being incapacitated, increasing its hit point pool by 50%, and de decreasing the time it takes to repair them by 20%. It also does the same thing with torpedoes. Magazine Mod 1 is there, of course, if you want the free debt flag. To avoid going Britannia, as some people wanted to correct me. <laughs> we don't need to go Jean Bart, so Britannia would be a better choice. In the second slot, I'm running Propulsion Systems Mod 1, which is going to reduce the chance of your engine being incapacitated by 20%, and decrease the time it takes to repair it by 20%. Uh, now, Steering Gears Mod 1, and I don't know if this is just placebo effect for me, but uh, I am finding with Propulsion Systems Mod 1 that I am losing my steering quite often. Now, I didn't play around with uh, running Steering Gears Mod 1 instead, so maybe it would be worth running Steering Gears Mod 1. It just kind of depends on, uh, you know, what your thought process is on what losing what is what, but I, I will be honest, I did notice that I lost my rudder quite frequently and I don't didn't really lose my engine all that much except for when a battleship decided to remove you know three quarters of my hit point pool in one salvo uh, engine boost mod one would be an interesting choice there if uh, you've got it that's going to increase the time that your engine boost is active by 50 percent in the third slot I'm running aiming systems mod one for the seven percent reduction in the dispersion of the main battery and the rest of this stuff the plus 20 percent torpedo tube traverse the plus five percent to the secondary battery firing range and the minus five percent to its dispersion uh, those are just added bonuses but the the seven percent reduction in dispersion of the main battery seems to help the ship out at longer ranges pick off those uh pesky bow in battleships and start them on fire uh the only other option here that i would consider running is aa guns mod 2 which is going to boost the firing range of your anti-aircraft gun mounts by 20%. Secondaries, not a big deal. Main battery mod 2, this is in direct contradiction with the, the module we're going to run later, so this isn't a good thing to add. So, uh, In the fourth slot, you can see I'm running steering gears mod 2 for the 20% reduction in rudder shift time. Uh, I can see a good case being made for, for, for propulsions mod 2, which is going to increase the engine power when the ship starts moving as well as 50 percent reduction in the time it takes to reach full power when accelerating this is going to happen in that negative six to six knot range it's going to help you out if you're hiding behind islands uh, a lot which i would highly recommend um just simply because of the lack of you know real durability on this ship i can see this being a, a viable choice however i feel if you're going to do that you're going to have to de ditch the concealment systems mod one which is the one i'm running in the next slot uh for steering gears mod three in fact i might even recommend you ditch concealment systems mod one for steering gears mod three anyway and this is the one build that i did not play with uh, to me, the ship is plenty stealthy, even without it. You know, you're going to be running up to about 12.6 kilometers in detection range. I can see this being very viable with uh, the range module instead of... Um, I think we got... Yeah, it's in the next slot. With the range increasing module instead of the reload module. But uh, I'm running Concealment Systems Mod 1, and that's what you're going to see in the battle replay. And that's going to decrease your detection range by 10%, as well as increase the dispersion of shells fired at you by 5%, um, which is a nice benefit. Steering Gears Mod 3, if you chose to run it, uh, minus 40% reduction in the rudder shift time, as well as minus 80% to the repair time of your steering. Uh, this makes the ship significantly more agile. In fact, it drops your rudder shift time if you double up on the rudder shift modules to somewhere in that five second range, uh, which is very quick. But the ship has what I call low rudder effort, which means that at part rudder, so at half rudder in one direction, it doesn't seem like the ship wants to change direction very quickly, but as soon as you heel it over to full, then the ship starts to change directions. In the last slot, 
I am running main battery mod 3, which is going to reduce your main battery load time from by, by 12%, so from 10 seconds to 8.8 .8 seconds, but it comes with the added detriment, added disadvantage of reducing your turret traverse by 13%, and that makes the... Turret Traverse can be a bit of a problem, especially if you're not running Expert Marksman on these things. Um, especially at closer ranges where you're sitting there waiting for the guns to traverse. I did play around with Gun Fire Control Systems Mod 2, which adds 16 point, uh, sorry, 16% to the main, main battery firing range. Pops it out to about 21 kilometers. Um, the ship really isn't all that useful at those ranges. At 21 kilometers, you're not going to be spending a whole lot of time there, and you're not really contributing much to your team, and what little contribution you do is going to be limited by the accuracy of your main battery. So this really, to me, doesn't add much to the ship, but hey, if it works for you, it works. Uh, I can also see AA Guns Mod 3 being a very a viable option here. This is going to increase the DPS of your... Uh, AA mounts by an additional 25%. If you're going to run this ship as an anti-aircraft escort, which you certainly could do with the amount of anti-aircraft that is on board, uh, this would be a, a very good option to take, especially if you were going to, like, say there was a Tier 9 Supremacy League, or if we ever get a Tier 9 ranked with a lot of carriers, uh, this, this would be a, a good option in this slot. Uh, what mods you take, you know, are entirely up to you. Like I said, the, there's an interesting side build that I didn't get around to testing. That's Propulsion Systems Mod 2 with Steering Gears Mod 3 or a combination of both rudder shift modules. The idea there is that at longer ranges, incoming fire would be significantly harder to, uh, you know, hit you. Um, quick look at the consumables. You know, we're, we're, we finally have a heal at Tier 9. Uh, it's nice to keep you in the fight a little bit longer, but quite honestly, I find that the heal on this ship is about as useful as the heal on Ibuki. Basically, um, it's it, he, you might get one or two charges off before getting completely removed from the from the game. Overall, didn't really enjoy the ship, so let's look at it in a battle video, and I can explain a little bit more there. All right, so. One of the things that I mentioned in the first part of this is that I didn't really care for this and, well, the, the care for the ship. And as I said, the, the biggest problem with it seems to be the fact that all of the ships that you end up facing up against all the time are significantly more lethal than the ships you run into consistently with, um, you know, within the, the tier 8 matchmaking. And so here we are, we're in a tier 10 match. There are aircraft carriers, so I suppose uh, this makes this a legit game. The heck, there's even a lot of, uh, not a lot, there's even a reasonable amount of destroyers, but there's a lot of battleships and not a whole lot of cruisers. Um, the, the map is Warrior's Path, and uh, I think usually on this map I end up going towards A or hanging around the islands at B. Um, it, it just kind of depends on, on the way that the enemy team is flowing. But because this ship is predominantly played at longer ranges while being mobile and using what little rudder shift that it has, uh, what little maneuverability that it has to help it avoid incoming fire, generally speaking, I'm going to favor a little bit more open water. So we'll head on over towards A. Now, as, as I stated earlier in this, basically this ship's limitations are entirely in its durability department. You will not do well. Uh, you can't bow tank much in the way of enemy shells. In fact, that uh, 25 millimeters of armor is basically going to stop uh, everything 14 inches and, well, yeah, it'll stop a 14 inch shell, which within the tier nine matchmaking, I don't think there are any ships that currently do that. Someone will correct me down in the comments, I'm sure. Um, basically, uh, well, I guess Scharnhorst is technically there with its 11 inchers, but uh, <laughs> overall, uh, you're not going to be bow tanking 15 inch shells. They will overmatch the front. You definitely can't bow tank 16 inch shells or 18 inch shells. No cruiser in the game can really effectively do that currently. Um, although I will say that uh, it seems to me Baltimore as a tier 9 cruiser is way more comfortable to play and I, a large part of that has to do with Baltimore's significantly smaller citadel and the fact that that citadel is predominantly 
at or basically barely above the waterline. So, uh, you know, one thing's certain here, shell arcs, it's very difficult to shoot over islands. However, um, they're not the best shell arcs in the game. They are certainly a far cry from Zhao's shell arcs, which are amazing. <laughs> And they're a far cry from the shell arcs of some other ships as well. So trying to shoot at the Z-52, but really not getting too successful with that. You can see our team is pushing A pretty hard. Got ourselves a Bismarck coming around the bend. And we're going to do our best to start him on fire in the process. We're going to get him with our baguettes. <laughs> at least that's the hope. You can see there, one shell, normal penetration, 924 damage. And you can see the use of speed boost here and the higher speeds makes it a little more difficult for enemy ships to, to engage you successfully. The, there is a, a struggle there to land consistent hits at range uh, thanks to your ability to quickly change, you know, not only speed, but to speed up real fast. Managed to get another shell hit in there and start him on fire. So fire off another salvo of HE here, trying to maybe if he decides to repair it, we can uh, we can address that. Oh, it's Hago. Gonna, we're gonna, ooh, ouch, that looks like it hurt. And uh, nope, one shell from a Bismarck <laughs> manages to take him out of the fight. So, well, we can't say we didn't try. So continuing our support of A here, I'm really a little bit closer than I'd like to be, however, you know, one, one key thing to this is that uh, basically uh, we, we have to support, but with, with the location of the enemy battleships, it's not a huge deal for me to be this close. Um, using my maneuverability and speed here a little bit to kite away. You can see that the HE does really well against destroyers, you know, lopping off 3k there. That's definitely nothing to sneeze at, especially when you're in a destroyer. But uh, the one thing I am finding that is extremely frustrating is the, the lack of fire starting and accuracy once it gets there. And he's really not that far away. You know, 12k is really not that far for a destroyer to be away from a, a cruiser, especially since cruisers are supposed to hunt those things. So, Salvo out there, we got four hits on him, so that's going to be somewhere in the 3k range, but the question is, uh, how much of him is left? He's not burning. We are up to 20,000 damage, and you can see here, we've managed to capture A, the enemy went A and C, which is not a good map strategy for this game, uh, for this match, I guess I should say. And for the most part, I think the reason why we're enjoying the relative success that we are is because we're basically being ignored. Uh, the, the enemy ships really aren't doing much in the, in the way of focusing me down. Um, I suspect that that's going to change if I get too far ahead of this, uh, this map here. Uh, the, sorry, this our team here. So Bismarck is up there, still trying to, to do some damage to him, but... You know, only getting a small amounts. And look, look at that dispersion. Like it, 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 it gets very trollish at times. Oh my! Well, we got another fire, but it was on the Yamato and not the Bismarck, which is the ship I was trying to shoot at. Managed to get slowed down to avoid the torpedoes. Now it's time to get the speed boost kick back in. Asking for a smoke screen there. I don't think we're gonna get it. Well, it was worth it was worth the effort. <laughs> oh, now okay, so he's he is gonna deploy it. Sweet. Need to focus down that Bismarck. I don't know whose fire that is, but down he goes. So Yamato is still burning. We are WAS and Ding until we can get into this smoke. Yeah, so this is this was a bit of an overextension, especially with all these battleships here. So gonna have to make our 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 turn. Thankfully, we got the smoke here to kind of help, but oh boy, we have a problem. The new smoke spotting mechanics have made it so that uh, that destroyer that's sitting in smoke right now can, in fact, see me. Well, boy, isn't that awkward. Gonna need to, to really stealth up there and to turn away, but 
looks like our, our team is starting to push up a little bit here, so eh, we'll make it work. <laughs> Probably, well, I wanted the I wanted the Z52 if I could get him. Nope, didn't get the Yamato either. Well, their team is starting to fall apart over here, and we've been extremely fortunate in the fact that nobody has basically looked their attention towards us to, to really end us. We have gotten ourselves three fires, so that's pretty good. Now we're going to take some time and we are going to... Well, for one, we're going to keep up this blistering rate of fire on this Monarch and uh, be that annoying person, especially since we're in the smoke and he can't really do anything about it. Uh, we are going to, to burst on out of this smoke here. And that is one advantage to have in the speed boost, and, and I can see that being a good advantage for the, the uh, engine boost module, being able to get in and out of those smokes a, a lot quicker. But once we, once we duck behind this island here, there's a, a relative amount of safety. And, and one other thing that the ship really, in my opinion, struggles at is that the ship's issue isn't necessarily that it can't do damage. In fact, it does damage just fine. What the ship really seems to lack is converting that damage into kills and by extension, you know, helping your team out. Sure, you, you're you're doing enough damage successfully to, uh, you know, to help others get the kill. But one thing I did notice is that getting kills on the ship is extremely hard. And I'm not entirely sure the reasons for that. My sus I suspect that the, the vast majority of the reason for that is because of the, the reliance on high explosive to do damage at longer ranges and not being a very strong ship in close quarters. And you can see here we're firing from stealth because we're behind islands and there's a smoke cloud in the way, which is significant in the, in the, the abuse of mechanics here. You can see this Missouri is... Uh, put himself in a bit of a predicament. <laughs> He's broadside to a large number of ships, including several battleships. Probably not the angle that I would have chosen there. Uh, again, not adding a whole lot of damage there with the high explosive. Trying to get another fire on him that would stick. Maybe hoping that he would burn out, but alas, no luck for us. So now we're back on to the decisions. What can we do to try and, uh, you know get some kills to, to you know, hopefully get uh, some good old-fashioned damage rolling up here. You know, 66,000 damage, man, I, I by this point in this match, I probably could have had a Baltimore up in the 80s and probably could have snagged a kill just because of the utility of Baltimore with its uh, radar. We could have dealt with that uh, Z-52 earlier in the match a lot earlier. Um, so at this point, we're, we're using islands as much as we possibly can to try and abuse cover. Now, I am closing the distance to a Hindenburg and a Zhao, and there is a good reason for that. One, I have 9k torps. Two, as long as they don't detect me, I, I should be in a pretty good position here to ambush both of them and to, uh, you know, deal a significant amount of damage, if not kill at least one of them. Of course, Hindenburg is a tough bird. That ship has very trollish armor. Of the two, I would prefer to engage the Zhao, and that sounds absolutely ludicrous, but the, the reason is quite simple. Hindenburg's AP is solid. It is very good, and it is extremely hard to, to take advantage of these ships in a way that would be beneficial. Now, the Hindenburg here, um, you can see AP... It adds up a little bit, but uh, he's going to expose himself. I'll put a set of those out there. He's shooting HE at me. Look at how much damage he did in one HE salvo. And Hindenburg's HE isn't even that strong. Saving our repair party there, but you can see we're doing some pretty good damage to him. And I'm staying angled pretty well to it, and poof, half your hit points. I mean, I was angled enough that my shells bounced on him. So at this point, we're, we're playing the alternate back and forth game because, uh, well, we kind of have to. <laughs> oh, got to be careful, though. Zhao is shooting AP, which means we need to angle. There you can see we finally managed to get some bounces, and we finally managed to secure the battleship Hindenburg's death. Whew. 
touchy. Very, very touchy. Kutuzov. AP Kutuzov. Okay. I know I can angle against that, but look at that salvo. That was a fantastic salvo, and there wasn't even any any uh, citadels in there. Exposing a little much, too much. Oop, there's a citadel hit. Making pretty short work of this light cruiser here, but uh, having to... This is this is where that turret traverse really becomes a liability. Whoa, look at that salvo. I was hoping for more than one citadel there. That would have been fantastic. Oh, don't expose too much. Need 28 seconds in order to get this heal up. Okay, so the, the Kutusov is, is angling in and out, back and forth. And, it, you know, at this point, it's just a matter of punishing him like that with the AP. Oh, my. Are we going to get the second kill? Please. Whew. So, two kills there in rapid succession. You can see how potent the AP is in very limited situations. Um, <laughs> apparently, they lost because nobody can see the boats. They sank two destroyers. But you can see the AP works really, really well, especially when ships are exposing just enough of a broadside. And so the ship's ability to brawl is extremely situational, but you saw how much damage that it took. Hindenburg's AP is special in that it has a really good Krupp factor, which means it can penetrate really well. Or Yeah, but it has normal, just the, the normal auto-bounce angles and normalization, which means that no matter what, uh, it, it, it's it's... AP is going to bounce unless it overmatches. And well, 8 inch AP can't overmatch the 25 millimeters of armor everywhere, but you only have 4 inches of belt armor, so when it does impact at that angle, its AP is strong enough to punch clean through that all the time. Which means a lot of normal pens. That's why you saw me lose half of my hit points to the Hindenburg in one salvo. And so, uh,. Not being able to angle and use all the guns is a detriment, but the biggest detriment here, in my opinion, is the, the fact that even when you do angle, you still seem to take a large amount of damage. So at this point, it's, it's, it's all about chasing down this Essex, and of course the 970 points hit, you know left in the match. Not a, a huge... Oh, well, there goes the end of the match. Just sink the carrier. Overall, you know, San Luis is, is a bit of a frustrating ship to play. As far as Tier 9s go, I would much rather play, you know, Baltimore. I think it's a much better ship at Tier 9, uh, which is saying a lot, because if you go and you look at the, the stats, I think the San Luis tops the charts. But overall, not my favorite ship to play. I'm glad Henri afterwards is a much better ship. Um, anyway, I'm your Peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.